I try to make my way around. Another Downey police officer is there that I know. And another veteran. And I'm like, hey, dude, tell me, is he all right? Is he good? And he looks at me and he nods his head. There's no business plan. There's no Osmiak. There's nothing. This is not in the business plan. This is not supposed to happen. I just became sick to my stomach. And I remember just walking over to the corner and just yakking everywhere. Nick Velez, United States Marine Corps. I was served with 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines, the Magnificent Bastards, uh, with Echo Company from 2005 through 2009. As an E-4 Corporal, old 311 Infantry. Born and raised in um, L.A., uh, specifically uh, East L.A. area. Moved around a lot uh, as a kid, but primarily stayed within the, the East L.A. Boyle Heights area. Um, grew up there my entire life. Uh, went to... Uh, Middle school, high school in the area. You know, growing up in the in the East LA LA area, you gotta you gotta always have some type of uh, I would say uh, 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 swag, right? You gotta know how to how to get along with all groups, all different types of people, from you know your your gangsters, your cholos to you know the the nerds, right? I mean, you gotta you gotta know how to talk to everyone, right? You gotta know how to move, right? I, I was involved in 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 just day to day normal life. I was a skater in middle school. You know, I like to play, I was part of the, the Latin jazz band at Belvedere Middle School. But then at the same time, you know, you have your friends that are, that are the taggers, that are, you know, the, the guys that are, 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 are break dancers. And, and you, you get involved in that life too, you know, not because you want to, but it's just part of life. You just don't really think too much of it. And you don't even think you're doing anything bad or, or involved with the wrong people. They're just normal kids just like you, right? And, you know, you get into high school and, you know, the party days, you know, kick in and, you know, there's party crews in those days and tagging crews. So, yeah, you, you get involved in that, but I, I would say that's by default. You know, I wouldn't consider you a, a bad kid or just your, your product of your environment. You know, I had a lot of friends that, you know, that I would say were into some really heavy, you know, stuff. Like, you know, we're into gangs and then I had the other friends that were more into the party the party party crews. and But also, you know, a lot of these guys were, were doing both. They were they were athletes and then they were after school, they were partying or they were athletes or then after school they were, you know, gang banging, you know, everyone was, that was just part of the life. And it just mattered on, on you know, when you went home and what block you lived in and, and it was gonna dictate, you know, what you did after school. So I grew up, uh, both of my parents, uh, first, I'm first generation Mexican American. Uh, both of my parents are from Mexico. Um, both grew up in the East LA, um, El Sereno area. Um, and you know, they're married till this day. Uh, they've been together since they were in middle school and, you know, great parents. I look up to them to this day. You know, they, they're nonstop. Uh, they're some of my biggest supporters and one of my biggest mentors is my father. Having them around throughout my life, I would say that, you know, they're always there. They're always on, you know, they're always in the back of my head, you know, whenever I'm, I'm about to do something wrong or, <laughs> or, or whatever I do, uh, I, I can hear them, right? I can hear my mom, I can hear my dad and, you know, you know, they have that saying in Spanish, uh, dime con quien te juntas, that I can eres, right? You know, that always stuck with me, right? You know, tell me who you hang out with and I'm gonna tell you who you are, right? But in the back of your head, you know, you, I hear my mom, right? I hear my dad. You know, you're not supposed to do these things. So I've always known, I would say right from wrong, even though I chose wrong a lot, I had a good family, a good support system. You know, I always wanted to join the military since I was in maybe, I would say, sixth, seventh grade. I, I knew I wanted to join the military, so had, had some type of gravitation towards those military films, right? From like, you know, Full Metal Jacket to like Saving Private Ryan, right? Like you, you know, you grow up and you're like, wow, these guys are, these guys are badass. These guys are heroes, right? And no one in my family had served in the military, so I didn't really have any guidance from my father or, or my mom or anyone to tell me, you know, what branch or, 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 or you know, who to join, when to join, or, or, or who I need to go speak to to join. But I always knew I wanted to join. I knew I wanted to join some type, join the military maybe get into law enforcement. I wanted him to go that route, right, as a kid. And I had a middle school teacher who, who was an um, army ranger. And uh, he always talked to us about, you know, jumping off planes and, and all the cool stuff you want to hear, right, as a yeah. kid. Um, and, you know, I always, I always wanted to join. I always wanted to join. And you wanted to join, just didn't know how to get there. Fast forward to 2001, 9-11 happened. So 9-11, I was in high school, a freshman at the time. I remember that day like it was yesterday. I remember walk, you know, walking into the living room. Um, my dad had the the TV on. Um, of course, the news in the morning, and probably CNN, Fox News, and uh, 
all I see is, uh, you know, the Twin Towers. I see a big building just in flames and, and smoke coming out. And I'm like, damn, Dad, what's going on? And it's like, oh, someone crashed into the Twin Towers. At that time, like, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm not an East Coast kid. I'm not I'm from the East Coast. I'm from L.A., right? So I'm like, oh, I think the Twin Towers are those tall buildings in, in New York, right? It's like, yeah, yeah, they, they crashed into them. They don't know who it was, if there was an accident or not. And, you know, you, you go, I go to school later on that day, and I think it was like first or second period, you know, there was a second plane that crashed into to the, to the second tower. And by that time, they knew that there was hijackers and, you know, the, the entire school was on lockdown. Yeah, I remember there was, you know, jets flying in through downtown LA. There was just, I mean, I remember that, you know, and I'm like, oh shit, like you know, something's going on, right? You don't really imagine where the future was gonna go, but you knew that, that our state and our county, our city was in some type of caution. They were aware of something going on. Right, jets flying in through downtown LA, and you know, growing up in the East LA area, I, I went to school in um, in El Sereno at Wilson High School. It's up on the hill, so you know, all these planes are, all these jets are flying in through downtown LA, you know, guarding the city, I, I suppose. Um, and you're like, oh shit, something's going on. And you know, you, you go home that day, you find out it was, uh, you know, hijackers, right, Taliban, right, that took pretty much our nation to the next level, put us on high alert. After that, I am like, okay, well. I need to do something about it. You know, I hear we're going to go to war, right? I hear we got to do something, you know? President Bush came out right away. The next day, we're like, right? We're like, he's like, yeah, we're not going to let, you know, anyone get away with this, right? We're going to, it's going to be payback. I wanted to be a part of that. I'm like, well, this is my time. This is my, this is my time to join. Just didn't know how at the time either. Didn't know how to go about it. Didn't know who I needed to talk to. I knew that I wanted to join that year. And freshman year going to sophomore year, I went to a program. My school was offering a program through the Devil Pups. Two-week, I would say, mini boot camp for high school kids in Camp Pendleton at School of Infantry. And it was ran by Marines. I'm like going to the Devil Pups that summer. So some kids were there because they were trouble kids. Some kids were there because they wanted to be there and I wanted to be there. I'm like, this is cool, this is fun. Um, so I loved it, I had a great experience. I was like, wait, you wake up in the morning, you know, you, you make your bed, you know, you, you march to chow, you come back, you drill, you learn some cool things about Marines, you learn how to disnass an M16. It was an experience for me that I'd never, never had before. So, you know, I walked out of those two weeks, you know, walking a little bit straighter, a little bit taller, and I felt like I was part of something now, right? I'm like, wait, this is something that I want to do. So I remember going back home and, you know, talking to my dad and saying, hey, dad, uh, you know, I, these Marines, man, they're, they're squared away, you know? And I remember, you know, waking up at, you know, zero five in the morning, walking, to, walking over to the chow hall at School of Infantry. And these guys were, you know, rucking up, getting their gear ready, you know, and they're ready to step off, going on a hump, right, on a hike, right, or maybe out to the field. But they were, they had a different mentality too, because that was post 9/11. I'm sure their training was a little bit more real than it had been before. Shit, we're gearing up. They're in Afghanistan. We had to send a couple units to Afghanistan, and who knows where we're going now. So you can tell, you can tell, because all the instructors would were constantly talking about, you know, oh, we're gearing up. We're gonna, you know, these, these instructors were Marines that were TAD. So these guys were constantly talking about, yeah, you know, when I go back to my unit, we're gonna deploy. And I was like, I don't, what's a deployment? You know, if you guys join, you're most likely gonna go to war. I was talking to my dad about, you know, this, this training. I said, these Marines are squared away. And um, dad, what can I do? What, you sh what should I do? Should I join the Marine Corps? Should I join the Army? And what, you know, he's like, well, like, what do you wanna do? And he's, he's always, my dad's always like, you know, do what you wanna do. Yeah, he's gonna be there to guide me but he's never really kind of like, you know, tell me to go a certain route. It kind of lets me figure it out on my own, right? And I'm like, well, dad, if you had a choice, I told him to join the Marine Corps or the Army. I said, who would he join? He said, well, the Marines. I said, I joined the Marine Corps. They're the most squared away branch that we have. You know, those guys are killers. My mind's made up. Went, right when like one of the first couple of days of my sophomore day, uh, days back in high school, I remember there was a recruiter that would go to, to school, never talk to him, but I would see him around campus. So I went looking for the recruiter and I found him and I said, hey, you know, introduce myself. My name is Nick Velez. You know, I'm a sophomore right now. I'm 15, 16 years old at the time. And uh, I'm like, I want to join the Marine Corps. I want to, I want to join. I'm like, what, what do I need to do? He said, well, how old are you? I'm like, oh, I'm a sophomore. He's like, well, you're not old enough. He's like, you got to be 17 years old in order to sign with you. So he's like, come back to me when you're 17. But in the meantime, you know, join us in our pulley functions. Come run with us, come PT with us, come work out with us, learn the structure. And if it's something you like, well then we can pursue it. So I did, I started getting involved. I started going to these pulley functions. 
when the time came, when I turned 17, uh, I had my parents meet me at the recruiting station at Plaza, Plaza del Sol on <laughs> Soto and, and uh, 8th Street. You know, I'm like, okay, well, I want to be an 0311 infantry. And my mom's like, well, que es eso? You know, <laughs> what's that, right? And I'm like, well, I explained to the job, I explained the job to them. And, you know, my mom and my dad were like, well, are you sure you want to do the infantry? Are you sure you want to go the infantry route? You know, maybe you could be a helicopter mechanic or, you know, <laughs> there's tons of other jobs, right? Staff sergeant, right, recruiter? And he's like, yeah, you know, I tried talking him out of it, but that's, he's, he's set on it, right? He's set on, on infantry and that's what he wants to do. And I'm like, yeah, I'm like, that's what I want to do, mom. That's what I want to do, dad. If you guys support me, don't say no. Just sign in the dotted line, please. You know, my dad knew what was going on, where the country was going and where it was. So he was kind of looking after me too. It's like, you know, I don't want my son to go to combat. And, you know, I have, he's, I see, see the invasion was going on at the time. So, you know, it was 2004 when I signed up. We had an idea where this country was going. We had an idea where, what, what type of war we were gonna be in. So, you know, they tried talking me out of it, but you know, I, I was set, I was set. I, was, I knew that, you know, 0311 Infantry was gonna be my MOS. When you go to MEPS, your recruiter picks you up at maybe 03, 04 in the morning, right? I already had, uh, had my going away party the night before. Shave my head, I show up and you know, he knocks on my, the recruiter knocks on my door and my dad answers the door. He's like, yeah, he's ready, he's ready to go. And to this day, that's one of the only times I've seen my, my, my father cry. Wow. Like, I remember him, you know, crying, saying, saying their goodbyes. And I'm like, don't worry, it's gonna be all right. I'll be back in a couple months. I was ready to go, right? I'm like, let's go. We do the entire MEPS thing. You know how MEPS is just all day processing. You get on the white bus by maybe noon and you head to MCRD San Diego, right? On your way down, you stop in Denny's. Denny's the stop. And you know what's funny is that not all the Marines get experiences. This is like the guys that are coming from the LA and Orange County maps. It's only us that really get experience it. You know, if you're coming in from another state, you're flying directly into San Diego and you're going to boot camp, you know, right when you land. I know, cause I hear all these others, they, they all have different stories, right? Our story, we drive down to MCRD and we make a pit stop at Denny's. Of course, on your way down there, you don't know where you're going. <laughs> they don't tell you you're gonna stop at Denny's. You just stop. We have, uh, we have, we have two choices. I remember I, I, I ate a Salisbury steak. All the, all the recruits, all the other guys who uh, had girlfriends and they were on the payphone, you know, at the payphone, you know, when we had payphones, calling their girlfriend and calling home, like, oh, I missed you guys, you know? And I was like, dude, I'm ready to go to boot camp. I'm ready to get this thing started. So yeah, we ate chow, we headed down to boot camp, down to San Diego. And right when we got on the bus, they had, the, they had a movie that they were gonna play, Full Metal Jacket. <laughs> so the bus driver threw on Full Metal Jacket on the way down to MCRD. And I'm like, oh shit, yeah, I've seen this movie before. This is cool. So all the, all the kids are like, oh fuck, that's gonna happen. Oh man, we're gonna get our ass kicked. You know, you, you see Private Pile, right? <laughs> Blow his brains out. You're like, oh, who's gonna be that guy? We make our way to, to San Diego. Drone instructors get up, you know, chew your ass out for a little bit, get on the yellow footprints, and the rest is history. I had a buddy who I went to high school with, Jimmy Guzman. All right, so he was my, my rack mate throughout the entire time in boot camp. There's a couple of funny stories that, that we both went through, right? I mean, you know, all, all Marines have, all, all recruits have to go through this, you know, stripping down for the first time in front of like hundreds of kids, going to the shower, butt naked, right? You're like, so all those are stories, right? But the stories that really stuck out were like, you know, those stories where we get into fights, right? With other, recru other recruits and, you know, him, we grew up together. He was from uh, the South Central area, but he was, he grew up with us in East LA. He would get busted in East LA. So this kid was a scrappy kid, you know, he liked to fight too, right? And I had a, a little background of, of boxing growing up. You know, I grew up at the De La Hoya Youth Center boxing, and I thought I could fight, right? Growing up in school, I was getting into fights. But I was also a squall leader, right? Once I got to my platoon, they made me a squall leader, and I was a squall leader throughout the entire three months of boot camp. So I was a squall leader. We go into the chow hall every day, right? We go to the chow hall in the morning, and your job as a squall leader is just to walk up and down the line, making sure that all the other recruits are reading their knowledge and no one's messing with your platoon, right? Because you have, you know, you take pride in your platoon, right? Platoon 1117, Charlie Company. I remember there was a platoon, I think it was a platoon 1119. There was these kids 
in the other platoon that were messing with my my guys. And they were just, you know, kind of like, just little things like, hey, hurry up, you know, or, or just trying to correct our guys. And I'm like, hey, mind your own fucking business. They were just talking shit. I remember this kid from Texas. I remember his last name, but he was just talking shit. And you know, the California Marines and the, the Texas Marines, right? We're, we're, you know, we're just, we're always kind of butting heads. And, you know, it's always like, we're better than you. And they feel they're better than us. And all the Californian Mexicans and versus the, the Texas Mexicans, we're completely different, right? And this kid was just messing with my buddy Guzman, Jimmy. And I'm like, dude, don't worry. I've seen that kid before. I see him on Sundays at church. I said, don't worry, we're gonna catch him slipping. I said, don't do anything right now. Just keep it cool. Cause <laughs> you act stupid, you get in trouble. Joe Church is gonna fuck us up when we get back. So I'm like, just keep your cool. Let's go to chow. Come Sunday, we'll catch him slipping. Don't worry, we got him. Come Sunday, we get in our chucks. It's our first day we're in our chucks. We feel so fucking cool marching to freaking church in our chucks. We're about to um, take a seat in the auditorium in the church, right? Which is the church's auditorium. And I'm like, hey, Jimmy, hey, Guzman, there's that kid. And I'm like, let's go, let's go talk to him. So I ran into that kid that we saw at a chow hall line that was, you know, talking crap to us. So I'm like, hey, what's up, mother effer? Say, remember us? He goes, yeah, what's up? I'm like, well, you want to take a walk? Let's go to the head real quick. He's like, all right, cool. Let's go to the head. You know, so I, I walk ahead. It's me. It's, then it's Jimmy. And then that kid, he brought his back up too, right? As soon as I walk into the head, it's kids right behind me. Boom, he just hits me in the back of the head. So right away I turn around and I just start, we just start scrapping. Bam, 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 going at it. First couple punches, hit him in the nose, boom. Break his nose and bloods go, I mean, all over the place. All, and he's, a, he's also one of those senior recruits, so he's wearing his Charlies too. Blood is all over his Charlies, he, he's bloody. I'm on the floor, I'm on top of this kid. My buddy Jimmy's fighting his buddy. You know, and then I remember the RP. The chaplain has an RP, right? The RP rolls in. He was, I, I guess he heard the commotion, heard what's going on. Like, hey, these two recruits are fighting in the hall, in, in the head, right? He comes in, he breaks up the fight. And, you know, growing up in the hood, growing up in East LA, you know, like, oh, dude, I got a jet. Boom, I take off. As soon as he walks in, I take off, go back to my seat, you know, come in, sit down. Jimmy's right next to me. I'm like, all right, brother, it's, we're good. Let's not say shit. Let's just let, we just carry on with church and we're good. Church started, we're 10 minutes into church. All these Jones searchers just march in, come in. They take the mic from the free, from the father at the time, giving the freaking, you know, giving a sermon. And he's like, all right, who's the recruit that punched the, you know, the Marine, this, uh, the senior recruit and this Charlie's in the head. And, you know, no, everyone's looking at each other and we're like, what the fuck's going on? No one, you know, no, no one even really knows what's going on unless you knew that there was a fight in the head. I don't have any blood on me. I mean, maybe, like, if I look maybe in my, my trousers. He's not like that guy. I'm like, all right, we're not gonna say shit. You know, this deny till you die, right? Kind of deal. The drunk was like, all right, we're not gonna go anywhere until we find out who did it. They went, you know, row by row, looking at everybody's hands, looking to see if they found any blood. And then, uh, my Marines in my platoon, they knew what happened. They knew it was me. They're like, fuck, Velez, they're not gonna let you graduate. They're not gonna let you graduate, like, because we're gonna graduate that freaking, that Friday. I'm like, fuck, dude. I'm like, you know what? Fuck it. You know, you did the crime, you'll do the time, right? So that kind of like stuck with me too as a kid growing up. I stood up, I'm like, all right, whatever. I'm not gonna bullshit him. Like, yeah, it was this recruit. And, uh, so I went, I went with the drone instructors. They took me to the back of the auditorium and um, they had that kid there. They had like, you know, they had like, <laughs> they had all kinds of paper towels on his nose, you know, just helping him out. They had a freaking corpsman there helping him kind of like, you know, bandage his nose and whatnot. And then, you know, they get me and they're like, you know, they're chewing me out. Like, what the fuck's going on? You know, you're also a senior recruit. You should know better than this. And why are you fighting another fucking recruit? You got blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, the drone instructors went out. They were like in a little huddle. They were trying to figure out what they were gonna do with us. And this kid tells me, hey, just tell them that we were both using the head, we we're using the pisser. And you know how it was like two to three to a pisser? 
He's like, just say there was two to three of your pisser and I accidentally like pissed on you and you hit me by accident, right? I'm like, fuck that, I'm not gonna say that. Like, no way. You know, so the drone instructor's like, hey, what happened? I'm like, hey, this recruit was talking shit all week on the chow hall line. I saw him here in the, at the auditorium and we had to do what we had to do, sir. All right. He goes, all right. <laughs> he kind of chuckled. He's like, all right. He goes, well, there's nothing wrong with you. You're good to go. He looked at me. There's no blood on me. He's like, all right, you, um, recruit, blah, blah, blah. Get your ass back to your squad bay and tell your stone stretcher what happened. He had to go back to his squad bay, all bloodied up, and tell his drone instructor what happened. He's like, you, go back to church, and when you get back to your squad bay, you tell your drone, your drone instructor what happened. So I'm like, all right, cool. I'm like, I'm not gonna say shit, fuck that. I walked back to church, did my thing, um, stayed, went back to church, went back to my squad bay, and lived life like nothing happened. That night, their drone instructor walks in. Who's right behind him? The kid I got into a fight with. And I'm like, oh, fuck. I know what's going to happen right now. I'm going to get my ass fucking kicked, right? Or at least hazed right in the quarter deck, right? So uh, they walk up. And they're like, they walk straight to the duty hut. And they tell the drone instructor what happened. My drone instructor walks out. It's like, all right, Velez, get the fuck up here. And you're like, damn it, I'm fucked. I'm about to, and I just took a shower. Like, I'm about to get fucked up again. And I just showered, I'm clean. Damn it. I told him what happened. They just started laughing. And this kid was, you know, bigger than me, stocky. I was 120 pounds, and I'm, so I've always been a skinny kid, right? Their drone instructor was laughing. He's like, you're telling me that the smallest, skinniest squad leader in the entire company kicked your fucking ass? So they hazed him. They put him on his fucking face. And they had him do mountain climbers the next fucking hour, hazing him while I just stood there and watched. You know, it was kind of one of those stories that the Marine Corps, you go into boot camp with your, with your buddy that you grew up with or you were in high school with. You get into a fight and he has your back and it feels like it's back in the day. It's like you're back in the black. Now we're in school of infantry. I'm in school of infantry with, you know, some of the guys you went to boot camp with, but also you make new friends there, right? Because Guzman, Jimmy went mortar T route. He was supposed to go 311 route. That's what we signed up for, but Right before boot camp finished up, they were taking, they needed jobs, they needed to fill a quota, I guess, right? For mortar T. So they were taking volunteers. And this guy's always been a car guy. So he's like, yeah, I wanna go mortar T. I'm like, all right, brother, do what you gotta do. I'm going 03, like, I'm gonna stick with it. So I stayed the 03 route. I went to school of infantry, Camp Pendleton, ITB, uh, infantry training battalion, Alpha Company, you know, uh, what they, they called it, Anarchy Alpha. Kind of like started rising up in the ranks, became the guide for second platoon. and. Um, I made all my boys squad leaders, all right? My buddy, Calvin Spencer, my other buddy, Manny Maeda. I had met Manny in boot camp and I'd met school, uh, Calvin Spencer at uh, SOI because Calvin was from LA, Downey area. And Manny just being another Chicano like me who had sim similar upbringing, we kind of just saw each other in the crowd and you know like, oh yeah, those are my guys. We kind of stuck together. So I made them my squad leaders once I was the guide. You know, we ran it like, I like a prison, right? <laughs> like, it was kind of segregated. You know, the Mexican Marines would hang out with the Mexican Marines. The, the white country boys would hang out with the, with the country boys. And, you know, you had your pockets, right? You had those, those, those country boys that were like, oh, yeah, that guy's cool. He's, he's down for his shit. He can hang out with us, right? So we're like the minorities, right? But we ran our, our, our platoon, second platoon, Alpha Company, like, programming, right? But at the same time, you know, having a background that we did and where we came from, we're always bending the rules a little bit. At that time, all you can do is drink, but we're not old enough to drink. You can't smoke weed, you can't do drugs anymore like you did when you were in high school, right? I was a pothead in high school. I think we all were at one point, right? And I also was part of the party crew days where you would sell Nas and nitrogen and make money. And I knew there was ways to pass a piss test without getting in trouble. We were doing our thing and I, I used to bring these little Nas cans, little computer cleaners. And I would, you know, show the guys like, hey, yeah, we used to do this back on the school bus, you know, going back home, you know, and then it gets you a little kind of crossfaded and, you know, you feel like a little high, right? So I was showing these guys like, hey, this is this world now, like you can do this and get away because is that you're not going to pop on the piss test. But there was a group of guys that we didn't, we were like, no, nah, we don't trust those guys. Like they can't do it. They can't hang out with us. So one of those kids went over to my, my wall locker and was looking for one of that, one of my cans, right? One of those computer cleaner cans. 
and I had specifically told him, no, you can't, you can't do it. Like, I didn't want to show him. I didn't want, because I'm like, dude, they're going to rack. Like, I can't trust you guys. I got called to the duty hut uh, or to the COC or whatever it was. Where the, and so SOI instructors were located into the office. Like, hey, they're like, hey, Velez, uh, remember they like, go pass word, have everyone change into boots and utes. We're going to go PT. I'm like, all right, cool. So I'm on my way back. I'm like, you know, back in SOI, you say at ease and everybody kind of like shuts up, right? I'm like, hey, at ease, second. At ease, second platoon. Everybody shut up because I'm about to pass word. I'm like, you know, change over to boots and utes. As soon as I say change over to boots and utes, all I hear is a thump. And this thump, it felt like I, I sounded like someone hit a wall locker. Then you hear a can just drop and just roll. And then Calvin Spencer and Manny Maeda both looked at each other and looked at me, and we knew what happened. We knew someone had to take a hit of our whip it can and something had happened because we looked back into my wall locker my wall locker is like directly to the right of the hatch and there was a kid on the deck laying on the floor and i'm like oh fuck so i knew right away that this kid took a hit of the whip it he took it for too long not supposed to go fucking past like two three seconds hit the deck passed out but of course, you know, you know that they're going to wake up, you know, growing up and house parties, you know, it's just, you know, it's, it's momentarily, right? They're going to come too. So at that point, everyone's like, what are they yelling? Freaking staff sergeant, staff sergeant, just trying to get all the, you know, the instructors in here. I'm like, dude, shut the fuck up. Just shut up. Like, don't worry. He's going to be good. I'm like, hey, wake up, wake up, get the fuck up. So he wakes up. He's like, oh, fucking trying to come too. And, you know, trying to get a census. I tell Spencer, Spencer, hide the can, hide the can. This motherfucker throws it back into my goddamn wall locker. So they get this motherfucker, this kid that, that passed out. They take him to the office to interrogate him. I take the platoon down to go PT or boots and utes, right? We're PTing, we're doing a thing for a good half hour. Next thing you know, they're like, I hear fucking the first sergeant and like other drones, other staffs, uh, other instructors going, what the fuck, the guide? And I was a PFC at the time. I was married to her, you know, you know, PFC Vlaz, get your ass up here. Yelling from the fucking third or fourth deck. You know, they're yelling at me and I'm down in a little fucking area down there, PT and doing what we need to do, pull-ups or whatever. I'm like, shit. I'm like, I knew, I knew this motherfucker had ratted me out. <laughs> I, I run up there and they're like, what the fuck did you do? What the fuck were you doing? I'm like, denied till you die, right? Like, I don't know. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. Yeah, right. Are you fucking getting high with these guys? I'm like, no, I'm not doing anything. Like, I don't know, man. I have a computer cleaner because I have a laptop and, you know, I have to keep it clean. And well, where the fuck's your laptop? There's no laptop in the wall locker. I'm like, well, I happened to take it home this last weekend because, you know, I live in LA and I go home on the weekends. So I had a fucking answer for everything they said, <laughs> right? I had a, an instructor that really liked me and, uh, and our, and our guys, of course, a Mexican-American guy, uh, Sergeant Contreras. Oh, no, Carreras, I believe. Contreras, Carreras. And he's like, Velez, did you do it? And of course, I'm telling him, no, I didn't do it. Like, I didn't do anything. Like, nothing. Like, he's like, all right, well, next thing you know, I see Calvin Spencer and Manny Maeda. My boys, right? Like, they're going to start interrogating all my friends, right? They walk up, and I'm sitting in the hot seat. You remember there was a hot seat, the red bench? Outside, and I'm like, fuck. And they're taking in these guys one by one and asking these guys, you know, hey, what happened? And of course, they're my boys. And they're like, you know, they're like, don't worry, I'm not going to say any shit. I'm like, all right. So they're they're backing me up. And I just met these guys too. Remember, like, it's no more than fucking two to three months. These guys put their career on the line, backing me up and say, the Les wasn't doing anything. He was, he was just doing his job as a guide. And, you know, this guy freaking walked in his wall locker and took a hit of it. First sergeant walk, you know, fucking gets me in there, interrogates me and all the guys. And he's like, all right, motherfucker, I know you did it. I know you're getting high with these guys. I'm like, first sergeant, I wasn't doing anything. I swear on my mother's life, I didn't do anything. I'm innocent. You know, I just want to graduate and go and flee. At that time, we already knew where we were going. We were all new. We were all, I was going to 2-4. Spencer was going to 2-4. Manny was going to 1-5. So we knew, like, dude, all we got to do is get the fuck out of here. We just gotta get into the fleet. We just gotta get into the fleet. He's like, all right, get the fuck out of here. You're on restriction. So he put me on restriction. I remember calling home. I was like, I wanna get the fuck out of here. I was already, I was thinking about going down to fucking, just getting a ride down to fucking TJ and going to Mexico. They were talking about 
charging me with attempted murder. They were just scaring the fuck out of me, right? You don't fucking know at that age. Like, you're going to the brig. You're not going to go to the fleet. You're never going to fucking see a day in the fucking fleet. You're done, you know? And I'm like, fuck. That instructor was telling me, don't worry about it. It's going to be all right. He's trying to calm me down. He knew what the fuck was going on. I didn't fucking know. I was an 18-year-old kid. I was like, sorry. I didn't, I didn't join the Marine Corps to get in trouble. I joined the Marine Corps to get the fuck out of trouble. I'm getting the fuck out of here. He goes, no, don't go anywhere. Do your weekend here. You're on fucking EMI. You're on restriction. Just stay in the barracks. You'll be all right. I stayed in the barracks that weekend in the squad bay. I wanted to kick this kid. I wanted to fucking beat his ass. I was like, fuck you, fucking rat. You know, and uh, that weekend, <laughs> that kid, I got, that's, there's another story, but I got into a fight maybe about two, three weeks before that. This kid named Puckett. <laughs> he was talking shit to my buddy Manny about, you know, telling him to put his cover on or whatnot. And I'm like, hey, just shut up, leave him alone. And long story short, we ended up taking a walk to the bushes and we got into a good fight. Um, he was a country boy kid from Kansas City, Missouri. And this guy kept slinging him and I was slinging him. And we went at it. After that, he kind of like had some type of respect for me and I had respect for him because it, it was a good fight. I'm not gonna lie, it was a good fight. He told me he's Velez. I don't, I don't fuck around with rats. I don't like fucking rats. He goes, I'm gonna beat them up for you. So that weekend, I'm in the squad bay and I'm like, all right, cool, you do what you have to do. I can't, I can't touch them, but you can touch them. So this kid ended up getting touched up by another kid that I had gotten to a fight with two weeks prior. Damn, this kid's walking around with a black eye. You know, he, you know they, they, they started interrogating him like, what happened? And you know, he was scared of that other kid, Puckett. And he's like, no, I, I fell and he didn't, he, he didn't tell on him. So I was happy that he got his ass kicked. I was in squad bay all weekend just on fire watch and fucking doing EMI and filling up sandbags or whatever the hell had me do. Right. Come graduation day for School of Infantry, you know, they're like, all right, well, let's go, you know, get to First Sergeant's office. So I went up there to First Sergeant's office. He's like, all right, Article 134. Everybody graduates. I can't, gra I'm not allowed to graduate with everybody. They took me, they took my, my guide position away. I was about to get meritorious Lance Corporal. You know, I was, everything was going good, right? Everything was going great, but they're like, all right, but you're still gonna go to the fleet. Well, of course, they need bodies, <laughs> right? We're in a time of war. They're not gonna just fucking kick me out of the Marine Corps. We all graduated, they all graduated. I gotta watch everybody graduate. I didn't get a dress up with my chucks. I was in my, char I was in my, just my boots and utes. Sergeant Correa's and Corporal Skull, I believe, got all the 2-4 guys together and they're like, all right, well, you guys are gonna go to 2-4. They're like, all right, all the guys that are going 2-4, change over to green on green. And then all the guys are going to 29 Palms. You guys are gonna go in deserts. So I'm like, all right, cool. So I remember I was already in my, you know, my freaking green on green. I was in my digis, right? It was a digi time, right? Yeah. He's like, ha ha. He, I remember the sergeant was like laughing at us. He was like, ha, ah, you guys are going to go to 2-4. They call you guys the bastards. Because everyone else has like cool names, right? He was like, yeah, you guys just got back from, your, your senior Marines just got back from, from Ramadi and they got worked out there. He goes, there was a, there was a bloody battle. And I'm like, fuck, okay. Like, so, so. We get on a bus and they drive us up the hill to San Mateo, area 62. I'm thinking I'm gonna drive, you know, a good hour and a half, two hours away somewhere. I don't know where, I don't know Camp Pendleton at the time. All we know is school of infantry and mainside. And I remember first sergeant said, when you get to your unit, you go up to them and you let them know that you got NJP'd and you're on restriction. I pull up to the barracks and we got the, you know, the old barracks. You know, everyone has, you know, one five, two five, three five had those nice new barracks that they were building with those hotel cards and all, right? We pull up and they pull us up, we pull up to, to the barracks and it's the old like brick barracks, right? The ones down by the, by the, by the armory. There was a grapple pit in the middle. There's these Marines grappling. There's Marines outside just tossing a football. All kinds of shit's going on. It feels like fucking jungle and there's mayhem. All kinds of shit. Our windows are rolled down. So when we pull up, all these motherfuckers just like, roll up to the bus. Hey, you know that scene with American Me or Blood In, Blood Out, when all these guys roll up and they're outside and they're like, kind of like just whistling at you and yeah. kind of like, hey, what's up, fresh meat? I remember exactly what Marine or what senior Marine said it, but they're like, welcome to the stock, motherfuckers. I'm like, shit, all right. So then they start reading off, you know, all right, you know, these guys are going to Fox Company, these guys are going to golf, weapons, Echo, and I'm um, you know, Echo Company, you guys are Hilo Company. I'm like, all right, cool. He said, I'm going to Echo Company. So I was, I was happy because Spencer was going to Echo Company. So now we're like, all right, I got my buddies here. 
And a lot of the guys I went to SOI with were a lot of them that I was cool with were Echo Company. Get out of the bus, all of us get in line, of course. Here we go, first day in the fleet. You know, they start sizing us up. Well, who's, 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 who's the LA Marines? All right, you raise your hand. Or who's from fucking Texas? They raise their hand. How many pull-ups can you do? How many pull-ups can you do? All right, get on the pull-up bar. And you're like, all right. So you start doing what they do. And right off the bat, I'm like, fuck, I gotta tell these guys that I'm on restriction. All right, well, I gotta say it because they're gonna find out. You know, I'm like, so I remember I told one of those, he was a Lance Corporal. I thought, I don't know who the, all these senior Marines are Lance Corporals. Like no one wanted to get promoted in the infantry back then where well, the cutting score was too high, right? They had low regs, right? They didn't have haircuts like we did. They had fucking gunny rolls. Like they didn't have their, their sleeves tight. They were just like heinous guys. They were heinous Marines, bro. They were not, they were not pretty. Literally, there was guys repelling from the third floor. It was fucking wild. I'm like, I remember telling this 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 Marine, it's like, hey, uh, can I um, can I tell you something? He's like, yeah, uh, I'm on restriction. I showed him my paperwork. He was like, what the fuck? How the fuck are you in your restriction? You just got, you just joined the Marine Corps. How the fuck did you get MJP? I was like, fuck, you're a shit bag. I'm like, oh fuck. Right away, and he just like, hey, this fucking kid is NJP. And everybody's like, what the fuck? And I'm like, damn. They're like, get your ass to the duty hut. So I went to the duty hut. It was a Marine on duty that day. Big dude, one of, one of the Ramadi vets, Corporal Bennett, right? This, this guy was on duty that day. I don't know if he remembers, but I remember that he was on duty. I checked in with him. He's like, all right, don't worry about it. Just make sure you get here at 1800. And because I had to do an EMI, right? So that extra military duty where you're just, you know, sweep the catwalk and police call and all that shit. So like, just come by. I'm like, all right, cool. It was a long day, you know, all the boots, you know, we were the first, the first boot drop that they'd seen in a while from deployment since they got back from deployment. They were happy to see us. <laughs> they were, and they had just got back from, from, from leave. So they were getting checked into the rooms too. Mm. There was guys still driving up, wow. checking in. Hey, where the hell is this guy? Where the hell is this guy? This guy's UA, he hasn't showed up. I'm like, wow, what the fuck? There's all kinds of guys UA not here? Like, what's going on? They're all talking about the piss test. I'm like, what the fuck's going on? Like, yeah, we're gonna get a piss test right now. I'm like, all right, well, I'm good right now. They put us all in a the room. They put us up in the, up in the, in the second deck. There was a, like a classroom. And, uh, and that's where the good training started. I felt like it was right away. We started training that, that next week. I mean, that, the next day I went to Sith, picked up all my gear and I was in the field that same week. See, what you have to remember is that, you know, 2-4, especially Echo Company, the company I was with, they had lost a lot of Marines in 2004. A lot of Marines. I'm talking about, you know, I think it was 20, 20, 22, 24 Marines in one deployment. These guys had been through it all. They had lost a lot of guys and they didn't want to go through that again. I mean, they preached attention to detail. All the things that, you know, you're not supposed to do, they enhanced it. They said, you know, forget what you learned in ITV, SOI. We're going to teach you now how it really goes, how, how shit really goes down. My senior Marines were, were, yeah, they weren't the prettiest looking. They weren't, you know, the garrison Marines. They were what you call the field Marines. They were all good to go. They were good to go. They were ready to, to any battlefield and hand it to the enemy. And they made sure that we were well trained. Our workup started right away. I always tell people, dude, I was a boot for like the first year and a half, two years in the Marine Corps because it, it took, I think my workup was 11 months before I got into country. From training to the field to Mojave Viper, CAX, we were on a, on a MU, the 15 MU. So we had to do at sea periods. You know, one week at sea, two weeks at sea. All right, now you're on your way to Iraq. Now it's gonna take you a month to get there. Um, and then we get to Iraq and I wanna say September, November, November. General Petraeus ordered, uh, President Bush ordered 20,000 more troops into the Al, -Am Al Ambar province, which was, uh, we sent us to Ramadi, Iraq. They split the battalion. Golf Company, Weapons Company went to Haditha, Fox Company, and Equa Company went to Ramadi. The crazy part about this, which I still remember to this day, the day they said, Echo Company, you're going to Ramadi. My battalion was in Ramadi in 2004, and my company, Echo Company, was in Ramadi. So they're like, I remember all my senior Marines looking at each other like, fuck, out of all the places, they're gonna send us back to Ramadi? I don't know if they were scared, I don't know if they were excited, but they were in shock too. Like, damn, that place was hell. And we're going back, boom, 
gears shifted right away and it started into like bring out the maps of Vermont. And they knew that place like the back of their hand. I mean, they knew it. They walked and patrolled that place day after day after day after day after day in 2004. That was right in the beginning. They were in the first battle of Vermont. They're like, all right, this is, you know, Gypsum. This is Nova where we got ambushed. You know, the Malab district this is where Golf Company got hit. This is, you know, MSR Michigan. This is Combat Outpost. They were just going over and I'm like, because I had heard these stories over and over as a boot when you're in the field, you're like, you know, you hear their stories, right? And now it's like, oh shit, we're gonna go here where that guy was killed, where that guy was killed. And that was where the snipers were killed. And that's where this guy died. And that's where, wow, like, oh shit, this is real now. I mean, they were talking about, yeah, we're gonna go to that building. Those guys are shady. We're gonna frag that, that house over there. I know they're shady. Like, I'm like, oh shit, like, they have personal vendettas. Mm -hmm. So I remember, you know, being on the smoke deck that when that, that day when they told us that we we're gonna go into Ramadi and it was uh, Corporal Licky and Corporal uh, Libby. You know, Corporal Licky's like, hey, Les, and he was a senior Marine, right? But he was always cool. I don't know, as a, as a boot, I kind of got along with a lot of my seniors. Like, of course I was always a boot, but I wasn't a, st you know, a dumb boot. <laughs> mm -hmm. They knew I, I was from LA, I liked to go party. A lot of them used to like to party with me up there. And, we had a, good, had a good relationship with my senior Marines. And uh, they're like, hey, Velez, are, are you scared? And I'm like, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not, and I wasn't scared. I'm like, I'm not scared, I'm just anxious. Like, I just wanna get my first firefight over with. Like, I just wanna get it over with, just so I could just get into the groove. He's like, don't worry. He goes, you'll be all right. Once it's all said and done, he goes, it's, it gets kind of fun. I'm like, all right, <laughs> all right, cool, weird. All right. <laughs> I think it was right before Thanksgiving, because I remember spending Thanksgiving um, at the Corregidor, we were across the street for Combat Outpost, which used to be the college when they were in, in Ramadi in 2004. And when I was there, the army had turned Corregidor um, into an outpost. Mm -hmm. So that was a FOB. They used, we used that as a forward operating base. I remember flying in to Ramadi. As we're flying in, you know, we're, we're leaving TQ. You know, we have our sea bags, we have our packs. You're carrying fucking combat load. You're carrying, I was a saw gunner. So I remember carrying all kinds of fucking shit. I'm like, damn, if I get fucking shot at when I get off the plane, what the fuck's gonna happen? I didn't know that I was landing in a friendly, in a friendly LZ. Mm -hmm. I seriously, I didn't know. I thought we were just gonna land in LZ and walk to the FOB. Whereas we're flying around, you know, you see tracers rounds going, you know, you see blue, you see red from, from the helo, right? You know, I'm like, damn, there's a firefight over there. And you see down over here, there's like fucking, you know, there's no lights in Iraq and Ramadi, right? So there's like, you know, they have burn pits everywhere. And some houses do have lights and there's lights that are flickering on and off, on and off. Mm -hmm. I remember landing in the back of the uh, back of Corregidor, in this field. And you're like, all right, what do we do now? And I'm just waiting for my team leader, Corporal Lopez, to say, hey, all right, let's go, we're moving. So I remember moving, we're walking, we're walking. I'm like, dude, are we inside of a base? He goes, yeah, I think so. I'm like, I swear, we didn't really know. And then once we, Keep walking up, like, oh shit, there's a bunch of army guys here. Like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, we're in the base, we're in the base. All right, cool. So I'm like, kind of like, calm down a little bit. And then uh, we're waiting that night to, to get our sleeping quarters. You know, they were gonna assign different platoons to different buildings. I was in the smoke pit. And all I hear is, you know, IDs go off, you know, firefights going everywhere, everywhere. And the army's there. And our senior Marines were like, yeah, you know, they're like, yeah, we've been here before. We were here in 04, like, we did this, we did that. They were kind of like, all kind of gathered around the fire pit. I remember I was smoking a cigarette after cigarette after cigarette. I think I finished like two packs that night. Not knowing that I was like, kind of nervous, right? Yeah. And I remember just hearing the stories like, yeah, what? I'm like, they're like, they were talking about OPs. Like, hey, is this OP here? No, that's not around anymore. I'm like, is that OP? Like, yeah, that one's around. We got hit there last week. And you know, they were just on like, fuck. Next thing you know, another some firefight kicks off down at the Malab, and then all the army do all the army dogs that we were talking to, they had to go to QRF. So I'm like, they're like, yeah, 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 let's go, let's go, let's go. These guys just walk, get up off their fucking seats, boom, get in the trucks, and they take off. And like, and all our all our seniors are like, all right, boys, that's gonna be us in a couple weeks, a couple days. Y'all better be ready. Day one. That was it. Wow. Yeah. Our company was put in Ramadi and we were like fourth platoon at ECPA. We were all kind of in a triangle position, like in a triangle where we had ECPA, that was fourth platoon. 
and we had first platoon by the industrial area. Then we had second platoon, my platoon, we were at OP Hotel on MSR Michigan. We had the industrial area in the middle to take care of and the Malab. One of the first couple of days, um, they started sending out patrols and they sent out first squad. I was in second squad. They sent out first squad. 100 meters out, first squad gets hit. Uh, All I hear is, you know, firefight going on. You know, we hear over the radio that the squad leader got hit in the neck. They're like, all right, second, second squad, you're going next. So we're gearing up, we're gearing up. I don't know what happened, but our platoon commander is like, no, third squad's going. Second squad, get up on post. So I go, I go on post, second squad, I mean, first squad, third squad's out. They're getting into it, right, out in the Malab area. But I remember the first day when I was on post and I was up there and I'm like, shit, all I hear is, you know, gunfights going on and I'm just waiting, waiting, waiting. And all night, you know, these guys come back and that, that night, these guys hit us right before sunset. Right before sunset, you know, we get we start getting hit. We start getting some sporadic gunfire. Then we just see muzzle flashes everywhere. And then, all right, here we go. So as a saw gunner, you know, I just start going at it. Yeah, I would just start there. That was our first firefight. The platoon commander, who was fairly inexperienced, never been to combat. Our platoon sergeant had never been to combat. Our senior Marines, Lance Corporals, PFCs, because they got NJP or whatnot, and Corporals, these guys were, they were vocal. They would talk about, you know, the plan of attack, and they would give their opinion, their guidance on what we should do, how we should hit the house, how we should hit the building. To be honest, you felt some, some type of safety around them. Mm-hmm. You knew that if shit hit the fan, they knew how to react. They knew, and they weren't afraid to voice their opinion either. They were tacticians. You know, so I learned right off of them. I learned, I learned from them a lot. I'm a quick learner. So right away, I would, I would learn, you know. And we used to have a lot of those tactical decisive games where they would put these scenarios together and we're, we're back in the rear. So my mind was always, always going 100 miles an hour. Like, all right, what do we do if this situation happens? What do you do if this situation happens? Like, I never wanted to be caught in a situation where I didn't know what was going to happen. So I felt like they, were, they, they prepared as well by the time we got to combat. I knew that we were in good hands. We had good leadership. When certain guys get hit, right? You, you know, you're like, damn, you know, that first firefight that we were in. Um, you gotta remember every time that we were into a firefight, I felt like every platoon was in a firefight. It wasn't only just us that was getting hit. ECP8, you know, fourth platoon, they got, they were in some heavy fucking fighting out there. First platoon, they were in some heavy fighting over there. They were constantly going at it too. And it was coming from all directions, from the Malab, from the industrial, from the Sofia, it was, it was everywhere. I want to say it was the same day that that Sergeant Espinosa was in the neck, which was one of the first patrols that we sent out. I want to say that same night that we were in a firefight all night, ECP-8, uh, fourth platoon, they lost um, their squad leader, uh, Corporal Libby, the guy who, who was at the smoke deck with Corporal Licky, mm. and who was like telling me, yeah, don't worry about it, everything's going to be all right. Right, so he was like, one of those like Superman squad leaders where like he was a shit hot squad leader. A lot of people respected him. We hear that he got hit during that night, but you don't really know what happens. You just hear like Echo, Lima, one, two, three, four, whatever their last four are, right? So you, you know someone got hit and you find out who it was, but you don't know if they, they made it or not. The next day, you know, our staffs aren't, he knocks on our hatch and I wasn't on post that, that morning. Um, and he's like, hey, Corporal Libby was hit last night, as y'all know, and uh, he didn't make it. And I'm like, fuck, dude, like, that guy was fucking good to go. Like, how is it that if that guy can get hit and not make it, then we're not all, like, we all have a chance of dying. Like, if that guy is gone, then it could be one of us next. Mm -hmm. So that's when reality hit, when I'm like, it's not a video game, this is real. The Marine to your left and your right, to your left and your right, might not make it. Like they, were, they weren't lying. And now it's real. And now we'll have our first casualty in Echo Company. Well, Echo Company was in Ramadi, and we did, you know, during that time, in the um, second battle of Ramadi during the search, it was all, we didn't live out in the, in, in, in the fob. We didn't live out, out at Corregidor. That we just used that as a place to go back to shower or, you know, use the phones once a month. 
if that. Every night, there's a log train. So at the end of the night, we got hot chow. All day it was MREs, at night, we got hot chow. Unless, that's if they didn't get hit by an, an IED, right? After we were done with our last mission, one of our last missions in Ramadi was a Tanim district. We went house to house, and every mission was about four to five days, and you just go house to house to house to house. We cleared Sophia, house to house to house. Then we cleared Tamim district, house to house to house to house. And in between these big missions, there was um, just daily patrols that you would patrol, right? After we were done with Tamim district, the Mu said, hey, um, I mean, again, I'm a Lance Corporal at the time, I'm, I'm a boot. I don't know really what was going up in the COCs, right? But apparently they got word, we got word that Echo Company needed to be sent to our route by Iraq because the um, LAR unit that was there was getting hit and they needed support. Here comes Echo Company, Hilo Company, right, to the rescue. After a couple months in Ramadi, they sent us to our route by Iraq, which is by the Syrian border. So we thought we were like, oh fuck, we just got done with Ramadi. This is gonna be, this is gonna be cake. We felt salty at the time, right? We had just gotten into a couple of firefights, all kinds of shit, right? We, we've done it all, right? Lost guys, guys got blown up. We've been fragged. I mean, you name it, we've been through it. And we get to Aruba, Iraq, you know, we're in this, this little fob called KV, Korean village. We're there for a couple of days, shit shower shaving, you know, having a good time in the MWR, calling our girlfriends or, or whoever you have at the time, significant other, calling your parents. Everything's good. And they're like, all right, well, you guys are gonna push to town, to Aruba, and you're gonna clear the entire city. They haven't been, hasn't been cleared in, since the beginning of the war. So fuck, okay, <laughs> here we go. So they give us our mission, you know, first platoon, you get this AO, third platoon, you get this AO, fourth platoon, you get this AO, second platoon, this AO. It's just normal, right? They break it up, right? Mm -hmm in the blocks and then in the squads. First day, we get out into Aruba and we clear at night. We would do all the clear missions at night. Most of the time they would be at night, house to house, house to house. I remember just having so much weight on my back and I'm like, fuck, it was, it was, a, it was a lot of work. It was, a, I felt like that mission, I was just carrying a lot. I was, I, I, care, I was carrying too much. It was January and January was fucking cold in Iraq. I always tell people like, Iraq was one of the coldest times I ever had in my life. Like just this, dry, cold weather, mm -hmm. right? You wake up, there's frost all over the place. When you're on post, <laughs> you know, you're just trying to stay warm, right? Keep your ears, your hands, and your feet warm and everything's everything will hopefully be all right. So I remember uh, just overpacking, water, chow, of course, ammo. You know, I always had an AT4 strapped to me just because I always wanted just to carry more than I had to. I always wanted to prove myself, right? I was a tough guy, right? So I remember, Going house to house, we, you know, we went firm. You know, everybody would have a had a had a phase line, right? So like, all right, when you get to this phase line, you go firm. So we went firm at our at our first phase line. Then that morning, all we hear is like, so we're you know it was it was second platoon. Then right next to us, it was first platoon that was clearing the area right next to us. You can hear. I mean, this is like no more than a hundred meters away, two hundred meters away at the most. So you hear what's going on. You hear when they use a flashbang. You hear when they kick down a door. Like, you know, sometimes, you know, the guys are on the block next door. And you know, like, oh, shit, they're over here. Or we're too ahead of them. We need to slow down, right? Because mm -hmm. everyone wants to move up together. So I remember, like, you know, hearing, you know, sporadic gunfire going on. Then all hell broke loose. Like, fuck, what the fuck? Second, what the fuck's first platoon getting into? I'm like, all right, whatever. We're not, we're, we're good here. Like, there ain't shit going on, right? Of course, our guys get all happy and start fucking firing everywhere they fucking can, just because you know how it goes, right? Just, it's our time to fucking blast. Fuck it, spray and pray. They're getting it on. We're going to get it on too. So I remember like going to bed that day. Yeah, I was getting off post maybe about four or five in the morning. And then around six, in the, six seven in the morning, that's when the fire, second, uh, first platoon was in a firefight. And they were like a couple blocks away. Because I remember seeing them in the buildings right, ne right next to us. A lot of my buddies I was in a boot with, all of them were in first platoon. Most of them were in first platoon, right? They were the guys I went to school with infantry with. They're like, hey, first platoon got hit. They got hit by a sniper. And I remember they were like, you know, Echo, Sierra, one, two, three, four, you know? And I'm like, okay, well, I don't know who the fuck that is. But in my mind, I'm going through all the S's. Like, damn, all my friends have an S. Like, there's Sackett, there's Spencer, there's... There's um, Sanchez, there's Soto, there's all kinds of S's that I know in that platoon. An hour later, 
they're like, hey, they got hit again. Another sniper they hit fucking, they, you know, I hear his echo, Mike, you know, one, two, three, four. I'm like, damn, what the fuck's going on? And then again, they're getting it on. They're just <laughs> killing everything in sight. We're still firm. We haven't gone anywhere because we don't have air that day for some reason. There's no air. When you're not when you're off post, you're fucking tired, right? You've been clearing all night. So you just go to bed and you just try to fucking rack out. And again, I remember my squall leader knocking on my door. He's like, Vlez, I gotta talk to you. I'm like, what's up? So they knew that I was close to certain Marines. They would always see me go to chow with them when I was back in the rear, or when we we're all like when the company was together, they see who I'd hang out with. And then I used to hang out with a lot of the guys from first platoon. He's like, hey, Vlez, um, just want to let you know that uh, Sanchez was hit. That was Sanchez that was hit. Sanchez was one of, one of the other boots that I grew up with, that we went to school infantry with, that we got sent to Echo Company with, that we got hazed with, that we were on every fucking working party with, that we were just, there was our brothers, they were all our brothers, right? We are all the same. And I'm like, he knew that that was my boy, you know? That was one of my boys, right? Damn, you kidding me? I'm like, is he all right? They're like, no, he didn't make it. Mm. And then Matus got hit too. Uh -huh. And, you know, Matus was like one of those, uh, fuck, this kid was fucking solid, maybe like 180 fucking pounds of muscle. The perfect Marine machine gunner. Had all kinds of like Ironman awards. Like he was the Ironman or something in SOI. I forget what award they gave him, but he was like a fucking badass Marine. If you ever think, you know, there's going to be a Medal of Honor recipient, it would be that guy, right? They're like, yeah, Matus didn't make it either. I'm like, what? So I remember I was like, it wasn't my time on post. I was, uh, I forget what squad was up there. And I'm like, all right, well, fuck this. I'm going on post. They're like, no, Velez, not your time to go on post. Like, fuck this. I don't give a fuck. I was just trying to go up there to fucking you know, get my payback. Both wow. of them were by the same sniper. It was a 5.56 five, round that they found mm. embedded in them mm. that killed them. So we knew that he had an American weapon, right? But we didn't know who it was. They said that he was shooting from a, from a, from a vehicle. So that's what we were kind of what we were looking for, right? We were looking for cars that had like a trunk and, you know, had like a, a makeshift shooting position, right? So that's like kind of the uh, the bolo they gave us, right? To be on the lookout for this. We didn't know who it was. They, I, I've heard stories that they found that sniper later on. They found out who it was and they killed him. Mm -hmm. um, personally, I know in our deployment, we went house to house to house to house to house to house to house. We even went into a mosque. And you already know the rules. Mm -hmm. You're not supposed to go into a mosque. So we went into a mosque because we heard that the shooting also came, might have came from a mosque. But it definitely wasn't like Ramadi. Mm. It slowed down a lot. So the worst of the deployment was the first five days of battle. No, we were ready. As a matter of fact, we, we were we were more than ready. We were just waiting for anything. I remember one you know some one shot, one pop shot here and there. <laughs> the entire company would come out and just lay down everything we had. It, it was at that point where it was just like we don't fuck around anymore. Ah, uh, yeah. You start losing your buddies, man. People yeah. are frustrated. You know, like I said in the beginning where, you know, where my seniors were like, yeah, we're going to go to this house and we're going to frag this house. We're going to frag that house. We're going to shoot that guy that lives in that house. At that time, I thought they were nuts. I thought they were crazy. I'm like, these guys have fucking problems. Like, dude, you can't just shoot innocent people. Like, what the fuck? Like, how do you know they have they, whatever happened to positive identification, PID? But then after you start losing your boys, some guys get blown up. Some guys get shot. Some guys you know, loose limbs or whatnot, then you're like, fuck these guys. All these guys are fucking evil. They're all bad guys. You start justifying why they're bad. You know, growing up in the hood, you know who the cholos are, you know who the gangsters are, you know who the, the drug dealers are, you know who everyone is, right? Mm -hmm. So we started justifying, well, I started saying, well, back where I'm from, I know who the bad guys are. So I know they know who the bad guys are and they don't want to tell us and they're going to let us fucking walk right into it. F that. My second deployment was a uh, the 31st Mew. So, you know, a booze cruise, right? You know, I mean, that's what we called it, right? We went to Japan, Camp Hansen, J-Dub. I was a senior Marine at the time. I was a team leader at the time. Um, I had already gone to a team leader school. Then I'd gone to assault climber school. So 
it was my time to shine now, right? I mm -hmm. felt like I was I was a salty Lance Corporal, right? A senior Marine, right? But I, I took a lot of pride in, in training my, my Marines and ensuring that they were well trained because at that time, I, I didn't know if I was going to re-enlist or not, but I wanted to go back to combat. That was for sure. Mm. I wanted to go back to combat. I wanted to go back to do my job. So the, you, know, you start choosing who your liberal buddies are, right? The guys that are cool, that they can pull girls too, right? You're like, all right, these guys are cool. I had just got into a, a fight a couple weeks before that, into a rumble with Seventh Com. And any, any infantry Marines that go to Camp Hansen or go to, our, to Japan know Seventh Com and know that they're the, they're the comm unit that's stationed there and they don't like any new unit that's coming in. So they pick fights with us and we pick fights with them, right? So I got into a fight a couple weeks before and I broke my hand on some dude's face at a cast. You know, at that time, I, I, I wasn't allowed to, to go off base for the first couple months because the first day of liberty in Japan, I got into a big fight with some Japanese civilians and we got jumped by like 30 Japs. Oh. Me and my buddy did. To make a long story short, they didn't NJP me because the first sergeant loved us because we were like his Ramadi guys, right? So he's like, you guys, you're, you're my combat vets. Are they my combat Marines? So I'm not going to NJP them. He's like, all right, Nick, he slapped me on the wrist. He goes, don't worry about it. He goes, you're not allowed to drink or don't go out on liberty, but I'm not going to tell you not to go out, but don't drink. I'm like, all right, cool. I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to go out. But after that fight, you know, I'm like, fuck, dude, I've already been in fucking Japan for the last fucking four or five months. Like, I want to fucking go out. Let's go out. All the guys are like, yeah, dude, we got to go to this place called Akuma Beach. They got a beautiful beach. Looks like a Corona commercial. White sand. We can rent a boat. We can have a good time. And I'm like, all right, fuck yeah. You know, I'm going to roll. I'm going to go. So grab a taxi. Boom. Head to Okuma Beach. Drinking. Not supposed to drink, of course. But I'm like, whatever, man. I'm 21 now. I, I turned 21 in Japan. I'm like, I, I want to drink. I want to have a good time. And I remember I was wearing my cast. And I remember tying a, uh, a plastic bag around my hand, around my, my, my cast, just so I can try it, right? Um, and I'm trying to wakeboard. Just we're all just drunker than shit, having a good fucking time. After we're done the, with the boat ride, we're like, all right, let's go look for chicks, right? Let's go look for, for girls, right? So we're out there talking to all these girls at the beach, trying to do our thing. It's like Nick, we need more beer. I'm like, all right, cool. I'll grab more beer. So I walk to the PX. Of course, you get the cheapest beer you see, right? Some Coors Light, PBR, whatever the fuck we got at the time. And uh, I pick up a case. Mind you, I have money to pay for this, but I'm already drunk, already don't give a fuck. So I'm like, fuck this, I'm walking out. So I just walk out, I basically fucking, you know, commit a crime on base, taking beer, on a beer run, all right? So I set up, I, I have a beer run on base. My buddy took a case, I'm like, we're not gonna pay for it? I'm like, fuck no, let's go. So all I hear is like, hey, stop, right? So as soon as I hear that, I'm like, fuck, they're gonna catch us now. So I looked to my left, looked to my right, and I remember right in front of me, there was this MP cart, like a golf cart, but it was like wrapped around with like MP, 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 MP. So I'm like, bro, let's take it. So I jump on the fucking MP on the driver's side, and my buddy jumps on the passenger side. Fuck, we take off. Woo. We take off to the other side of the fucking beach. Just fucking take off. We're just drunker than shit fucking just ride, joy riding. We end up fucking leaving the fucking MP fucking uh, go-kart somewhere on the fucking beach, somewhere on the sand, we leave it there, and we just go about our business. Fucking kill that pack, that fucking 24 pack of beer. It's about time to go home, about, I don't know, maybe 1800, we're like, all right, we can get the fuck out of here. That time, we're walking up, we're gonna go grab a taxi to head out, and who's there? Like fucking 10 MPs. Looking, they were looking around, looking around, and I'm sure they had got word that there were just five Marines out there. You know, give them, they give. I'm sure they had a description of us. Not everybody knew what had happened. I didn't. I don't think I told everyone that I got into some, that. I took a freaking that I stole a freaking MP cart, and they're like, "Hey, you guys, get over here!" And they're like, "What the fuck? What's going on?" Like, "Hey, we know you guys are the fucking Marines that stole the fucking MP car." And my buddies didn't know shit about. It. They're like, "What the fuck are you talking about?" No. I was over here, I was doing that, I was snorkeling. And I'm like, dude, you're fucking crazy. No, we haven't, we, we, we weren't. Like, that wasn't us. Like, you got the wrong guys. No, you're coming with us. So they put us in the back seat, the patrol cars. I'm like, dude, don't worry about it, we'll be all right. 
and they took us to this freaking little MP station, Air Force MP station, and they threw us in their cells. And we were there and they're like, again, interrogating us. What the fuck did you do? What were you doing? You know, we know you guys took the beer. We know you guys took the car. I'm like, no, it wasn't us. I'm like, look at the cameras. There's no fucking cameras. I was like, look at the cameras. I was like, I'm like, it wasn't us, man. It wasn't us. So I'm like, just deny it till you die. <laughs> we were there all fucking night, man. All night until our platoon sergeants came to pick us up. Our platoon sergeants came to pick us up. And they're, they're fucking chewing us out. Like, you guys are gonna fucking fry. You guys made us drive all the way to fucking Akuma. And we're all looking at each other like, fuck that. We just got away with this shit. Like, we'll be all right. I'm like, does everybody shut the fuck up? Just shut up. I mean, we all had similar upbringings, right? We're all fucking down for our shit. We drive back to base. First sergeant again, Velez. You know, they, they get everybody in there. They're like, they're, they're asking them, hey, who did it? Like, no one did it. Was Velez drinking? No, he wasn't. Because I had sobered up by then. You know, first sergeant was asking everyone, did, who did it? Like, no one did it. You know, was Velez drinking? No, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. You know, I, I, I'm the last one to get interrogated. I'm like, Velez, what the fuck happened? Like, I told him what happened. I'm like, I wasn't drinking. I wasn't drinking. It wasn't me. You know, he's like, all right, motherfuckers. He goes, fucking, you guys are lucky. Get the hell out of here. Go back to your, go back to the barracks. We rolled to the barracks and, the, and, you know, the entire barracks are there. Like, everyone's asking us, what the fuck happened? We heard you guys got fucking, they heard all the stories, right? None of them true, of course. We heard you guys got arrested out there, blah, blah, blah. We're like, Nah, don't worry about it. Shut up. Don't worry about it. And they let us go, man. They let us go. I got lucky. So during my time in, in Japan, right before George Bush left office, that's when he passed uh, the new GI Bill. I remember reading the paper, the Marine Corps Times that day, like, new GI Bill, all veterans will receive uh, Sergeant BAH. I'm like, damn, what the fuck Sergeant BAH make? I'm like, hey, what do you fucking make, Sergeant? <laughs> and he's like, oh, we make fucking... Blah, blah blah it all depends where you live and you know i'm like okay and he's like yeah and they pay for your education and it doesn't come out of it doesn't come out you don't come out of pocket and i'm like wait a minute so i started doing the math and i was like damn i can make more money if i get out of the marine corps and i've always been motivated by money yeah you know there's a lot of other stories that i didn't mention where i always had a hustle i always had a hustle in the marine corps from cutting hair and soi to doing laundry for everyone on the, in the company kind of like gathering everybody's laundry bags taking it down and, and doing their laundry for five bucks a bag to ironing their clothes, you know, and I would, I would start a little business and I would make some good money. You know, I, I've always been motivated by money and yeah. kind of like uh, I wanted to get out and I knew that, you know, my dad, and he still is a, a, a real estate broker and a lender, and I knew that I'm like, I can go out and, and I can go that route. I was thinking, you know, maybe I did my time already and now it's time for me to get out and, and, and maybe maybe go to law school, maybe be a cop or you know join the FBI or something. But I knew that, I was like, all right, maybe it's time for me to go. After the Marine Corps, right off the bat, I signed up for community college. I was going to Pasadena City College, living my best life. GI Bill, <laughs> unemployment, all the good stuff that, the, that you rate after you get out, right? Mm -hmm. it's making more money than I had have ever made. I was like, this is fucking awesome. This, this is a great life. It was hard for me to adapt into the civilian world because uh, of what we had gone through and you know the Marines that we had lost and my friends we had lost and you go into the civilian world and place like Pasadena Community College where you know most of these kids are liberal minded you don't feel like you're part of them right you know that you're just different right even the guys that are our age because mostly you're 22 23 at the time mm -hmm. most of these kids are 18 19 year old kids but I felt like a man I felt like I was already way older than these kids were. I had experienced so much, had gone through so much. I looked at them like kids. So I couldn't communicate like now how you can communicate with all your friends and see what's going on. So you don't know where they're at. Sometimes you, maybe you didn't even get their number when you said goodbye. So you, you don't have that connection anymore, right? That connection is gone. I remember my buddy Keith Hernandez, he was really good about keeping tabs and texting me all the time. Like, hey, what's up brother? How you doing? Everything good? Yeah, everything good. And he lived in Seattle, Washington at the time. Oh, he still does. He was from Seattle, Washington. So I'd call him. I'd call my buddy Caldwell. Like the guys that like your core five guys that you were closest with, right? Just keeping tabs on each other. Like, yeah, I'm doing this. I'm doing that. But fuck, dude. Like, this shit sucks, bro. Like, and all you hear is about the guys that stayed in going to Afghanistan fucking getting it on. So you're like, man, what the fuck am I doing here? Like, I should go back. I'm, you know, contemplating if you should re-enlist at the time. 
now you're in college and now you're reading about the war. You know, I took a class called, um, it was a history class, but it was an analytical history. So you start really diving into why we were in World War One, and you start really diving into these conflicts. You start diving into your conflict and start doing research. And you're like, fuck, dude, like, what was really going on? What do you mean weapons of mass destruction? And we didn't find any weapons of mass destruction. What do you mean it wasn't the Iraqi insurgents that took down the Twin Towers? Wasn't that the reason why I joined the Marine Corps? So wait, I wasn't fighting those guys at all? I was fighting a whole different group of insurgency? All the guilt starts coming up, right? Where you're like, damn, like, so we lost all these guys for what? Like, you know, you really start diving into that. And you're like, shit, fuck that, man. Like, I don't want to think about it. So at that time, I wasn't really getting along with my parents because I felt like I was a young man and my parents were still trying to look after me. They're like, hey, why are you drinking every night? Why are you going to the bars and getting into fights? Why are you drinking and driving? Oh, I'm 23. I, I, I've got to figure it out. I know what I'm doing. I've been through it all. You can't tell me what to do. I remember I'm like, I got to get the hell out of here. So one day I just said, screw it. I'm out. I went to Seattle. I went, I'm like, all right, I'm going to attend Bellevue College up here. So I went to Bellevue College in Seattle. And I wanted to, I was working on the transfer, on their transfer program for their, for their law, for the law school with UW, University of Washington. And um, I had my eyes set on that. I said, that's what I want to do. Fast forward, I'm in Seattle. I'm, I'm with my, one of my best friends, Keith Hernandez. He was from Seattle. So I went up there because he lived in the area. He's like, right off the bat, he's like, what's up with your fucking long hair? And, you know, I was, I was like, it's like, dude, you need to cut that shit. I was like, all right, cool. So I got a haircut again. I remember I got a haircut and started looking squared away again, started working out again and, you know, getting back in motion. And I'm like, damn, this is what I needed. I needed that support. So I'm up there. I'm going to college for a year. Um, I launched a business up there and things are going great. You know, I, I thought I was going to stay up there for the next, I thought I was going to live my life in Washington, in Seattle. Um, and at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to like bridge that that relationship with my family, with my mom and my dad, and kind of like, I was talking to them a lot more now that I'm away, and I'm like, you know, kind of like where you're like, damn, I miss you guys, I'm sorry for being a fucking dipshit kid. Mm. So I, I, you know, I'm on the call with my dad all the time, with my mom, and you know, my dad's, you know, been in the real estate business. He knew where my mind was at. He's like, man, you, you know, you need to open up a business, you know, you're an entrepreneur, you know, you have that, you've always had that in you. You know, why are you opening a business, a business in, in Seattle? You need to open up a business down here. He called me and he's like, hey, uh, there's this restaurant bar across the street from my office in Downey. He goes, it's for sale. He goes, I want you to fly down here and take a look at it. I think you'd like it. And he, he, knew, he knew that, what, you know, like I've always talked about opening a bar, a club. You know, in college, I was, I was doing a lot of promoting and I've always been in the party scene, right? Mm -hmm. So he knew, like, all right, he, Nick, my, Nick might might be interested in this, and maybe this is how I can get my son back here to California, <laughs> right? <laughs> so he calls me. I'm like, yeah, Dad. I was like, yeah, I got some money saved up for my GI Bill. I'm like, uh, maybe I can help out. I can, I can, I can, I can buy this bar off this guy if he's interested. Flew down to California. I flew down to LA to, to Downey specifically, where my parents were living at the time. And uh, he's like, all right, we went to go take a. We, we, we went, we went to the bar. We went to the restaurant. And he's like, all right, this is it. What do you think? So it's a small restaurant, right? It was this is 2012. I'm 25 at the time. Um, again, felt like I was a man. Felt like I knew it all, right? I had launched my first business in Washington, successful. I had got a lot of press up there with, you know, the Seattle Times. That we had made the cover of the free Seattle Times. I knew how to use marketing to my advantage. I'm like, damn, I could do something here. Like, I can do it, but I can't do it alone. You know, I remember just a quote by Mark Cuban, you know, he's, uh, then when they asked him, you know, how is it that, that you went from, uh, you know, from Silicon Valley and being a tech, you know, an IT guy to now um, owning the, uh, the Dallas Mavericks and, you know, and going to the finals and whatnot, right? Mm -hmm. And they're like, man, you're a smart man, you're a genius. He goes, no, wait, wait, wait. He goes, I am not a smart man. I put smart people in the right position. Even if I didn't know the restaurant business, I know the restaurant business, I can get smart people that know the restaurant business and help me grow it. You know, that's when Facebook was was now, it was public, right? It was for everyone I would see on Facebook when I was in Seattle. I'd see uh, uh, my buddy Calvin Spencer. He had gone to culinary school after the Marine Corps. And we would always meet up when I would fly back home. 
we'd always meet up on January 21st because that's the anniversary of uh, uh, the day that uh, Sanchez and Matus were killed. Mm -hmm. So we, him, myself, um, my buddy Aguirre, Sackett, the guys that were in first platoon, first platoon that lived in Southern California, we'd make an effort to meet to meet that day, right? To kind of just honor our brothers. So we always kind of still kept in touch through Facebook or through whatever. And I reached out to him. I said, hey, I see that you went to culinary school and that you opened up a restaurant in Long Beach. He had opened up the kitchen. He was their executive chef. And I said, hey, I might buy a restaurant bar. Um, I might need your help. What do you think? You want to come meet me at this restaurant so I can show you? He goes, yeah, for sure. I'll meet you there. So one day we we met at Bastards. Well, what it was then, it was like a, a it was a barbecue restaurant. And I meet him there and I'm like, hey, Cal, what do you think about this place? Like, I'm thinking about we can open up this restaurant and we can honor our brothers. We can name it like freaking heroes or something that had like honored our bros and we could put all their names up there, all their, their pictures on the wall and what we did, right? We could honor them and and we could live their story. We could live, um, we could live, we can honor them through through the restaurant and now ensure that they have a legacy forever. He's like, bro, I'm fucking down. I'll put in my two weeks tomorrow. I'm like, are you serious? He goes, yeah. I'll I'll make I was like, dude, I don't know shit about this. He goes, don't worry about it. I got it. Cause he got he had gone to culinary school. His last year in the Marine Corps, he was bartending in a bar in LA. So he had the front of the house experience, the bar side, and he had the back of the house experience. And anyone in the restaurant industry who has a front of the house and back of the house experience and knows how to run both, they're studs. Mm. And he was a stud. All I knew was how to party. I had a lot of friends on my, on my phone, on my contact list, and I can get this place packed. And I had that marketing side to it, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we're like, all right, let's do it. So. One day we're shooting pool um, and I'm like, hey, what are we gonna name the restaurant? We gotta name it something. And it has to honor our brothers. And at that time, like Heroes was taken already. I think there's a restaurant called Heroes. I don't even know if it has anything to do with military vets. And every name that we were coming up with was taken. So we're shooting pool and, you know, like I had mentioned earlier in the story, what our nickname was, right? The nickname of our battalion. So he goes, and we call each other bastards from time to time. So we're shooting pool and he goes, hey, you bastard, you're next. So I looked at him and I'm like, that's it, bastards. He's, he looks at me like, what the fuck are you talking about? I'm like, we're gonna name our restaurant Bastards and we're gonna honor the magnificent bastards, our battalion. He goes, fuck it, let's do it. And I'm like, he's that kind of guy who just didn't, never questioned it, just said, let's roll with it. Mm. We opened on Memorial Day. When we decided to name the, the restaurant Bastards, the first thing we did was call a local banner company, graphic company, sign company, and said, hey, I need a big banner. I want it. They're like, well, what is it going to, what do you want in the banner? I'm like, I just want our, our logo, Bastards, coming soon. And they were like, even the sign company was like, Bastards? This is 2012. Let's remember, this is before Instagram, TikTok, mm -hmm. you know, like, it wasn't okay to say that word. Now there's all kinds of restaurants with crazy names, right? Yeah. So back then it was like a derogatory word without you, no one even had, no one, Google wasn't accessible like it is today to look up a word and say, is it a good, is it a bad word or not, right? So everyone thought it was a bad word that we were just being funny or just like talking about bastard kids. As soon as we put that banner up, that same day, I was getting calls from the city of Downey, from City Hall. But right before that, I had gone to City Hall, I applied for my license, my business license, and I had put down bastards. No one batted an eye, no one said anything. So I'm like, all right, cool, they're wrong with it. I paid my license fee, I had my license, I had my business license, right? City starts calling me, emailing me, avoiding their calls. <laughs> I'm like, I don't wanna talk to them, I don't wanna talk to them, fuck that, right? I don't wanna go there. At that time, right when that happened, I'm like, all right, the marketing side, you know, Nick's marketing side kicked in. I'm like, all right, you know, like they say, even bad press is good press, right? The city newspaper was, was already leaning into it. A restaurant in Downey named Bastards is opening up. They had no story behind it, nothing. But the church was, churches, local churches were against it. Community members were against it. Council members were against it. Everyone and their mother was against the name, but never bothered to ask us why we named it Bastards. So I said, wait a minute, we have a story here. 
So I reached out to Fox News, ABC, the Marine Corps Times, everyone I can. I was like, all right, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna, we're gonna do some hearts and minds now, right? We're gonna let them know why we're named bastards. The Marine Corps Times reached out to me, reached out to us. ABC News, everyone started reaching out to us. And I told them, hey, we're two combat veterans. You know, the city is infringing into our First Amendment right, well, freedom of speech. We fought for our country and, and our, our freedom to be able to name our restaurant anything we'd like. As a matter of fact, we f our name is the 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines, the Magnificent Bastards, and we, we, wear, and we, we, we wear that name with pride, that bastard name. So how is it okay for us to go into battle with the name Bastards, but then when you come back to the civilian world and now we can't be called Bastards? That doesn't make sense. Marine Corps Times started calling the city. ABC News started calling the city and like, hey, we're, we're, you know, we're writing a story on, on this new restaurant in your town, Bastards. And you know, these two veterans, 24, 25 year old combat veterans that you know, all they wanna do is open up a business and have a place for their veterans to call home. Right off the bat, you know, the city calls up and they're like, hey, can we just have a talk? Can we talk, can we talk to you? I'm like, yeah, sure, let's meet up. We'll meet up at City Hall. Because our thing was like, dude, I don't want to talk to the city planner. I'll talk to the mayor and to the council members. So we want to go straight to the top. You know, in the Marine Corps, they always told us, don't, chain, don't skip the chain of command, but that's for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we knew that we needed we need to skip the chain of command here. We need to go straight to the top. So we went straight to the top. We met up with the council members. These are 24, this is 24 and 25 year old, Calvin Spencer, Nick Velez. And they're grilling us, they're like, who are you guys? Where are you guys coming from? What's your experience in the restaurant business? And he's like, well, culinary school, blah, blah, blah. I told him, well, you know, my family and I are opening up this restaurant and we're gonna name it Bastards to Honor, 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines, the Magnificent Bastards. And that's the battalion that we both served with in combat. And we're gonna honor all our brothers that never made it back. And they're like, well, how can we even say that from the beginning? They're like, well, you guys never asked. They're like, well, can you guys change the name to maybe like MBs or like Magnificence? They're like, no, we're the Bastards. We're the Magnificent Bastards. So we're gonna stick with their name. Like, oh, well, can you think about it? Like, yeah, all right, cool, we'll think about it. So we left that meeting with like, <laughs> telling them we we're gonna think about it. And we knew we weren't gonna change it. Like, no, this is it. We're gonna stick with Bastards. So we did. The Marine Corps Times published the story. We made the front page of the Marine Corps Times. All my buddies start calling us, DMing us on Facebook. Dude, fucking Calvin, Spencer and fucking Velez are at it again. These guys are opening up a restaurant now, right? <laughs> to Echo Company Marines, right? Nice. Doing it. Back at it. The guy who backed me up in School of Infantry, who said, who backed me up and said, no, Nick Velez didn't do it. He was, of course, one of my squad leaders in the, comp in, in the platoon, but I mean, he didn't really know me more than a month or two. And he backed me up. He gave his career up for me. And I felt like it was my time to pay it forward. So I'm like, all right, you're my new partner. We're doing this. We ran the restaurant, we opened up doors, and right away, we became your modern day VFW American Legion in a place where not only Marines, but all veterans call home. We opened the restaurant in 2012, right off the bat, you know, like, all right, celebrate the Marine Corps birthday. Celebrate Marine Corps birthday, marry with the Veterans Day event. And as you know, you've been to our events, our Marine Corps birthday, Veterans Day event, is the best Marine Corps birthday celebration that any Marine, even any other branch of service will ever celebrate at our restaurant, right? All of Southern California, all of California, in the entire US, nobody was celebrating the Marine Corps birthday before we started celebrating the Marine Corps birthday. The only time you ever saw anyone celebrate the Marine Corps birthday was on base or when you were active duty. Mm -hmm. It wasn't cool. But we're like, all right, we're gonna give it like a cool, we're gonna make a cool event out of it. It's not gonna be all fucking blues and, and, and everybody comes in with freaking high and tights. Like that's not what we're about. First Marine Civilian Division, first Mars Civ Div, right? Remember that? Yeah. Version of a Marine Corps birthday. So we did the cake cutting ceremony. We had the guest speaker. We had the oldest and the youngest Marine cut the cake, but we made it cool. We had beer gardens. We had live entertainment throughout the day. We have, I mean, all kinds of military vendors, right? Selling their, you know, we're promoting 
entrepreneurs, we like to call ventrepreneurs, veterans that started their own business, that are better owned, better and operated, better nonprofit organizations. The VA had a booth there. They would bring in their van every year to help vets. So we're like, let's make this a home for all of us. Our resources that day with cool merch, good food, awesome beer, even better entertainment and a good, good vibes. And we did that. And that put us on the map. The Marine Corps birthday, I would say to this day, put bastards on the map. Every event we can, we're, we're celebrating St. Patty's Day. We close down the streets. You know, you see for the Marine Corps birthday, we close down the entire block, mm -hmm. right? We started off with the park, started off with the restaurant, moved out to the back parking lot, the back parking lot. Now it's like two entire blocks and we close down, right? So now we're doing that um, for a couple years. We, one of our buddy, Manny Maeda, he served eight years in the Marine Corps. After we got out, he, he stayed in. He went to Afghanistan. He was getting some with 2-7 out there, and he stayed in, always talking to him. Oh, he'd always come back to the restaurant and celebrate the Marine Corps birthday or Memorial Day events with us. So he went up to Long Beach College at the time. He was no Cal State Long Beach. And we're like, bro, you need to come help us out. It, with us three, we'd be unstoppable. It would be like back in SOI. Manny was also bartending in San Diego at the time. So I do. Why are you bartending in San Diego, driving from Long Beach to San Diego every every weekend? Like, doesn't make sense. Like, just come with us in Downey, and help us run front of the house operations. Calvin will run back of the house operations, and I'll run all freaking admin and marketing. Like, we'll we'll all have a job. So he did. Manny came on board. It was me, Calvin, and Manny, back at it, fucking grinding away, every fucking day. Just we felt unstoppable. So at that time, we're like, all right, guys, it's time to grow. Let's put him for a liquor license. Let's get our liquor license in, in another town and let's open up another, another, another Bastards. So we did, we put in for Riverside County and we're like, all right, let's open up a restaurant in Temecula. Let's do it, let's, let's go to Temecula. Cause we had buddies that lived in the Temecula area, you know, Anza, up, up, we used to go shooting and hanging out with our buddy Gino up there. So we're like, yeah, we know that Temecula was a hub for veterans as well. It was like a modern day Oceanside, but cleaner, right? Yeah. And with some land. So we're like, yeah, that, let's go there, man. Navy Federal is there. They did the research for us. Like, we know that's a place to go and call home. So we go, we, we, we put in for the, for the liquor license. We get the liquor license. We start looking for a location. It's like in 2018. And we find a location in Temecula, the location that we have today. One Saturday, I'm, I'm at a family made party in Encinitas. Manny's back home in Indio. We all ro rotate. We all take duty days, right? I, take, I stand duty one day. Manny stands duty the next day, Calvin stands duty the next day, and we all kind of rotate. Everything is going so perfect. I mean, perfect. Because our goal was to open up a Bastards in every town in America. So that's when we really look at ourselves and envision that we are that modern day VFW American Legion where veterans can call home. One Saturday evening, I get a call from my buddy. He's our, he's our barber. We all, we all had the same barber, our buddy Andrew. And he's like, he'd work on the weekends as a security guard. He was a big dude. And, he worked as a security guard at Bastards and he, he had left his post at Bastards and he's like, hey, Nick, um, I drove by uh, Stewart and Gray and Paramount um, and right by Taco Bell and there was a, uh, an accident, a motorcycle accident. And that bike, that bike looked like Calvin's bike. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, so was it Calvin or not? You know, he's like, I don't know. I'm like, dude, you need to go back to the accident. You need to go back to that scene right now and figure it out. I'll head up there right now. I remember getting to my car. I'm like, all right, I need to get the fuck out of here. Let's go. Because if it was my boy, then we got to be there for him, right? I'm calling him. I'm calling him. I'm calling him. He's not picking up. I'm like, okay. I'm like, I'm texting him. I'm like, hey, what's up, fucker? I'm like, hey, I heard there was a fucking accident on Student Gray and, you know, and Paramount and the bike looked like yours. Are you good? I wasn't getting a reply. I wasn't getting a reply. So I'm calling the restaurant. I'm like, hey, where's Cal? I'm like, oh, he just left. I'm like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, okay. I'm like, okay, let me call his brother. His brother's at home. So I call him like, hey, is, is Cal home? He's like, yeah, his truck's here. I think he's in his room. I see his car back here. It's, it's, I'm like, I'm like, dude, he's not, he's not, he doesn't have his car. He doesn't have his truck tonight. He's, he's riding his bike. Are you sure it's him? No, I'm almost sure, man. Don't worry about it. I'm like, all right, cool. I'm driving. I'm like, oh no, they say that he's, he's at, he's home now. He should be good. But I'm still driving up. Then I get a call back. No, man. They said, they, they just called the restaurant. They said he was on his bike. So it couldn't be him. It, it wasn't him. At that time, I'm getting a call from everyone. Everyone's calling us. Everyone's calling me. 
And my buddy Andrew's like, hey, dude, you got to get down here. He goes, it looks like it's Calvin's bike. So I'm like, all right, fuck, I'm fucking going 100 miles an hour, 120, 140 miles an hour. I just wanted to fucking hurry up and get there. And I'm just having this feeling. I'm like, damn, what the fuck, dude? I'm calling, calling Manny. I'm like, Manny, they, they, dude, there was a bike accident uh, in Downey, and it looks like it was Calvin's bike. So I'm going to go up there and check it out, bro. He's like, dude, I'm, I'll, I'll roll down too. So he drives all the way from fucking Indio back to Downey. Cause that's what brothers do to each, for each other, right? We're, mm-hmm. we're there, we back each other up. So just like always, backing each other up, right? So we, I show up to the scene, um, and right when I show up to the scene, there's that easy up, you know, that Downey PD had up. And it's never good when there's an easy up around. There's no, there's, there was ambulance, but the ambulance was still there. No one had took anyone out, they were just there. Means you're gonna be there for a while. Means we're gonna be there for a while, right? So at that point, everyone's there. They, I'm like, hey, just close down the restaurant because we're a family, bastards. We're we're a family. Like all our employees, like we were all family. Like we were young. Think about this. We we're under 30 at the time. All our staff is there. All our friends. All the regulars, and they're all just fucking bawling, mm. just crying. So I roll up and I know all down EPD. They're all good guys. They're all our friends. They all go to bastards after the ships. A lot of those guys are prior military. I remember going up to the officer, won't say his name. Hey, bro, let me in. Let me go in. Let me get in. You know, let me, I was trying to make my way in and he stopped me. He's like, no, dude, you can't go. You can't go in. I'm like, dude, come on. I see it's Calvin's bike. Let me go talk to him. Let me make sure he's all good. He goes, no, he can't go in. I'm like, why? Is everything all right? Is he good? He didn't, he, he didn't say shit. So I'm there and I'm just hanging out. I'm like, fuck, dude, I need to fucking go in. I try to make my way around. Another Downey police officer is there that I know. And another veteran. And I'm like, hey, dude, just fucking tell me, is he all right? Is he good? And he looks at me and he nods his head. And I'm like, fucking A. So there was an easy up and there was a car. There was an SUV. I want to say it was a Lincoln Navigator. And the easy up was almost on top of the navigator. So they were ch- covering something up. Apparently, um, Calvin was traveling on Paramount, south on Paramount, um, and he was blindsided. And um, he ended up underneath this, this vehicle. And um, apparently he was still there. And they were, they were getting him off. They were, uh, they were gonna move the vehicle and pull him out. I asked the officer again, I said, dude, just tell me, did he make it or not? Like, just tell me. And he nods his head again. I'm like, that's when everything shifted. That's when I was like, fuck. I just became sick to my stomach. Like, I, I, I had never felt this feeling. I just, you know, I'm like, fuck. I felt like, um, like kind of like, like when Sanchez and Matus were killed, but this is even worse now. I felt like, this is my brother, this is my, there's no business plan. There's no Osmiak. There's nothing. This is not on the business plan. This is not supposed to happen. I just became sick to my stomach. And I remember just walking over to the corner and just fucking yakking everywhere. And I'm like, his mom is there. She's crying. I felt like, fuck, what do I do? Like, how do I even comfort her? You know, like, like imagine how I'm feeling. Imagine how she's feeling. Like, I always think about the Gold Star families, right? Like, yeah, we hurt. But imagine their families. Mm-hmm. They hurt t- 10 times more than we do. That was her older son, that was her baby. She's like, no, Nick, it didn't happen, right? Not my baby, not my baby. And I'm like, you know, how do I break it down? That it's, yeah, this shit, does, it's real. We're, this is real life right now, we're not dreaming this. And that's when our life changed. That's when bastards changed. That's when it was just like, fuck. This is, you just took a, one of the most important pieces to this puzzle. And we're never getting that piece back. We closed shop for a couple of days. Bastards being a home for veterans when, when you know, we had lost a couple of buddies before that to suicide, to um, one of our, our buddies was, was killed on the line of duty. Uh, he was a police officer and Bastards was like that home where everybody came to mourn and to gather. But now you just stabbed us in the heart. You really hurt us where Manny and me were like, I don't feel like going in. And he's like, I don't feel like going in with anybody. We didn't want to answer anyone's call. We didn't want to talk to nobody. They just, they just, they, they, they took that dagger and they fucking put it straight in our, in our heart. And we didn't know how to react. And we're, we were done. 
it took a while for, for us to get together. Our staff, which is our family, you know, they said, Nick, Manny, don't worry about it. We know you guys can't come in right now, but you guys trained as well. We're gonna open up shop. We gotta be a home for these people because everyone's coming in every day and they're, they want us to open. They want a place to call home. They want us to support us through these tough times. They opened up shop for us and little by little, you know, once we, once we buried Cal, then we started coming back little by little, but it took a while for us to really get back into motion. We didn't know if we were gonna open up our Temecula restaurant at that point. Everyone's like, oh, what's gonna happen to Temecula? We don't know, we don't know. We, we don't know, man. So we didn't open our Temecula restaurant. Well, that happened like 2018, 2019, we're like, all right, we're gonna open. 2020 it was COVID. Nothing happened that year. Yeah. We lost all our contractors. Well, we didn't lose them, but everyone was kind of taking a break. No one can go into work because someone would get COVID. They're out for two weeks, for two months. Then they, they, then they lose their subcontractors. They're out for two weeks, two months. So the entire year was just a complete dump. We didn't do anything until 2021. We went back into the motion. We're like, all right, Manny, let's do this for Calvin. We honor him every day now. Mm -hmm. We have a big mural outside of Bastards on 2nd and Downey Avenue. The same mural that we have at Bastards in Temecula. And it's a, our version of Calvin's cartoon face, mm -hmm. you know, turned to the side with his beard, a battle cross, an American flag, the 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines emblem, because those are all the things that pretty much embodied Calvin and, and told his story and what he pretty much took pride to live and honor every day. We opened up our Temecula restaurant in September of 2021, and we honor Calvin every single day. Bastards doesn't move and is not successful without Save the Brave. So in 2015, it was a rough year for us, for the Bastards. We started losing a lot of our guys um, to suicide. Justin Pack, uh, Marari, but the one that really hurt us was one of the squad leaders and one of our, our, our I would say, our, our mentors, our senior Marines that we looked up to, which was Sergeant Simon Lickey, the same Marine that was at the smoke deck when him and Libby, when Licky and Libby were telling me not to worry about anything, that everything was going to be all right. Simon would always come up to California and hang out with, with Calvin and myself at Bastards. This guy was a stud. He was a good looking guy. He got, you know, he'd go out and he'd, he'd take a, go, a girl home for sure. Like, just a smooth guy, right? From Minnesota, you stay in t contact with him. You know, he's like, he, his plan was to move back to California. We were gonna give him a job at Bastards. We were gonna give him a home. He was gonna crash in Calvin's, Calvin's couch until he got everything squared away. Um, then one day, I get a call from my old company commander, uh, Major Scott Hewson. He just called me and he was crying. I'm like, hey, what's up, sir? What's going on? He's like, fucking Simon, man, fucking Licky. I'm like, what's up? What's up with Simon? What's up with Licky? He goes, dude, he's fucking gone. I'm like, what? Simon? No, dude, I was just on Snapchat. I was like, he was texting me like he was having fun. He was like fucking taking a swig out of fucking of a Jack Daniels and brushing his teeth with it. Like he was just Simon, like just the funny guy, always laughing, always having a good time. Like, no way, it can't be. Are you sure? Like, what happened? He's like, Nah, dude, he took his life. I said, get the fuck out of here, no way. No, man, it can't be fucking, it can't be Simon. That was a big hit with Echo Company because everyone loved this guy. He, he got along with everyone. There's not one person who can say he was a bad person. He's just that guy where just everyone gravitates to him. Everyone gets along with him. Again, Calvin and myself, you know, and Manny are like, all right, well, we gotta do something about this. We can't just let this shit go. Like, what are we gonna do? He passed away right before the Marine Corps birthday. So we're like, all right, well, this Marine Corps birthday, everything that we raise, we're gonna take all these, all these Marines, all the guys that we served with, and we're gonna fly them to Minnesota to be there for his family. And we're gonna be that support group that we all need. Because we all need the support. We all need each other. That's what we miss, guys. We, we need each other. We need each other. It needs to be a buddy check, too. So I think we raised like 18 grand that year. I think it was, I think it was about 18, 20 some thousand. Bastard started buying flights for everybody. We're like, all right, we're gonna buy flights. We're gonna do this in honor of, uh, of, 
of Simon Licking, we're gonna get everybody together. Saved all our money, we bought everyone flights to fly to, to Minnesota, to uh, Delano, and um, it was a big reunion. It was a big 2-4 Echo Company reunion, that's what it was. But during that time, we felt like, fuck, this is awesome, this is great. Everyone's together, man, it feels so good to be around each other. Like, hearing all the stories from before, from combat, from Livo, from Simon, just all his, all the funny stories, everything's coming together, like, this is awesome, man. We miss this, dude. Everyone wanted to hear about Bastards, like, oh, they wanted to, everyone wanted to go to Bastards. It was just like, because that was their bar. Like, what battalion had a bar? Our battalion had a bar. That battalion that nobody wanted to be a part of, the Bastard Battalion, was the one leading the charge for the Marine Corps birthday, was the one that was, was on the map, first Marine bar. I mean, Marine Corps was established at a bar, so that said a lot, right? Yeah. Born in a bar. So, and then we realized, when Calvin and myself flew back, we realized, dude, we gotta do something. Like, it can't just be us. We gotta, we, it can't just be us, we need support. Like, well, why don't we start a nonprofit organization? Like, all right, let's do it. So we started a nonprofit. We named it Save the Brave. It started off with two, four veterans, but now it's grown. We have a board, Manny sits on the board. We have a corpsman, my former company commander sits on a board. We have a treasurer, all Marines and one corpsman, right? So it's, it started by, you know, started by vets, four vets. And our mission is to connect veterans to other veterans to build that strength of character. And we do that because we believe that there's no better form of therapy to deal with post-traumatic stress and TBI. There's no pill, there's no vaccination that can deal with it better than veteran to veteran therapy and hanging out with your brothers. Because we got a taste of it when we were mourning Simon's death in Minnesota. We realized that this did something special, man. After that, for the next couple of months, everybody was on a group text, just texting each other. Like, this is what we need. How do we do this? All right, let's form a nonprofit. So I put together the, the idea. I said, all right, we're gonna name it Save the Brave. We started putting together our board. Like, all right, we launched it with the help of one of our other buddies who was a, a Vietnam veteran, Ernie Delgado. All right, so now how are we gonna serve as vets? Well, if we know that we wanna connect veterans like, let's make this cool. Let's not make this some kumbaya crap, right? And there's something cool where like, we all wanna have fun, right? Everyone wants to have fun. People forget about having fun. So we started first started doing like bike rides together that didn't really get guys' attention. They were like, all right, let's do some equine therapy. Or like, a couple guys showed up and we put together a fishing trip. Like, dude, let's go offshore fishing. Let's rent a big boat. Let's pay for all the freaking chow. Let's pay for their drinks. And let's just take them fishing. Fuck it, let's do it. And that was the beginning of Save the Brave Offshore. 2015 to today, we have, we service, we've serviced thousands of veterans, not only two, four vets now. We open it up. Um, as long as you have an honorable discharge, um, you can come along in our fishing trips, completely free for veterans. And we have what we call salt therapy, our fishing, our Save the Brave Offshore program that's spearheaded by uh, one of our board members, he's a Corbett. Lalo Lopez. We take veterans fishing monthly on our boat out of San Diego or Huntington Beach, wherever the fish are at, wherever, wherever they're biting, we follow the fish. And we believe that salt therapy, getting out in the water, just getting out there where you have no phone reception, where it's just you, the ocean, and the fish, puts you in this, in this world where you're like, you know, it kind of feels like you're in the Marine Corps a little bit because, you know, we give you binos and we're like, Hey, make sure you're on, be on the lookout for any birds that are diving, right? Any boils in the water, right? We kind of give them that, that bolo list. So they're kind of like, all right, they're, they're on their toes, right? And then they're away from their family. It's kind of like that deployment feel. You have, you're, you don't have any phone reception. You can't just call home, right? You got to depend on the guys that are left to your right of you. Even if you don't know how to fish, you got to learn, right? Yeah. So now we, we get guys on fish. We say the tug is a drug, right? So once you start <laughs> tugging on that, on that fish, that's the drug and that once you get your first bite and your first fish on deck, you get them on the boat, you're hooked. And now Manny Maeda, he spearheads the jiu-jitsu program. So we have a jiu-jitsu program at Save the Brave called Save the Brave Jiu-Jitsu, where we sponsor 100% of the veterans tuition from either white belt or whatever belt color you, you're at to black belt. That's our goal. 
because we believe that post-traumatic stress and TBI and the effects of battle, you can't fix them with what a fishing trip. You can't fix them with one day on the mat. It takes time. Mm. And our goal is for you to be able to work through that because we believe that exercise and getting out on the, and then com just that combative lifestyle that we miss, jiu-jitsu can fill that void. And it has for many veterans now. Mm -hmm. So currently we just launched the, the jiu-jitsu program this year and we're already at, at capacity. So we're now we're, we're fundraising again, you know, we're writing, you know, applying for grants, trying to, to grow a bigger budget so we could take more veterans onto our program. Any veteran, Marine, Army, Sailor, Coast Guard, Air Force, Airman, whatever you are, whatever you call yourself, if you wanna take anything from this interview, just remember that you're not alone. There's a lot of us brothers, sisters that you serve with are sometimes struggling through the same effects of post-traumatic stress that you are, you know, whatever you're feeling inside and you can't pinpoint what it is, you're not alone. There's another brother, another sister that's going through the same thing you are. So don't, don't take blame for it. Don't feel that you're, you're in this battle alone. All you gotta do is reach out to your, to your buddy. And if your buddy's not around, reach out to savethebrave.org. Come fishing with us. Come on, you know, join a jujitsu program. Get involved. If it's not Save the Brave, Get involved with another nonprofit. Give back because you took an oath once to continue to serve your country. So continue to serve it in many ways. You, you don't have to put on a uniform to serve your country and serve your brothers. You can do that by volunteering in a nonprofit organization. So I welcome you to come on board with Save the Brave. Join us at Bastards Canteen. You don't have to drink a beer. You don't have to eat chow. You can just come and hang out, have a glass of water and just hang out. You know, come to the Marine Corps birthday. You know, visit us at bachelorscanteen.com. We have events every single day of the month. You know, we're not alone. And you can always reach out to me on Instagram, social media, and I'm here to support our, our brotherhood. You know, we said in the Marine Corps, we take care of our own. And at Bachelors Canteen and at Save the Brave, we take that serious. That's all I have to say. Semper Fi.